they're going to be my example here in a few minutes. And uh, just you can be right up behind me. Now I've got my security guard behind me. <laughs> Praise God. The Lord has been doing an amazing work the last few Sundays in this house. Last week there was probably 15 or so, maybe even a little bit more than that. We didn't leave until almost 2 o'clock because the presence of the Lord was just so thick. And the holy, dynamic glory of God was just so heavy on us. And it has been our prayer for the last couple of weeks, and we have preached this way, that something needs to happen where we contact God. And we have that divine connection with him. There's ways to know about him. The Bible says that you can look at creation and you don't have an excuse anymore. The Bible says that you can look at the body of Christ and life and nature and you don't have an excuse to know something about him. You may even have physical evidence. He may have done something for you. How many here have the Lord has done something for you? So all across here, you've got evidence, but you can know about him. You can have evidence of him and still not contact him. I want to contact him. It has been my prayer for the last several weeks as the Lord began to lay upon my heart. And today I'm coming to you again one more time, leading up even to next Sunday because it will kind of flow together with that. But in order to contact God, something has to shift within us. And so I'm going to read today, and then I'm going to use these folks as an example in just a minute. But Jeremiah chapter 17, I'm reading from the NLT today, verse number 9. It says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Everybody just say, my heart deceives. So why are you listening to it? It's deceitfully wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. Now, there is a mistaken theology in the church world today that says that we don't need to do anything to get anything from God. You just believe on him and he'll give you whatever you want. Now, I'm not saying that you can earn your way to heaven but God has some promises in his word that says he'll release some things into you only if and after you put the effort into doing it. You see, that connection that we long with God is not a one-sided effort. God's been trying to get our attention since the beginning. God's been trying to speak to our spirit since we were born. Even before we were born, the Bible says, he was in the womb intertwining and putting all of us together. I'm just trying to tell you that the connection with God is not a one-way street. It's got to be a two-way street. And if it's been a while since you've been connected with God, I would question not God, but your heart. I know that's... Hard hitting. I don't know what the Lord's doing the last couple of weeks, but He's challenging us, and sometimes a challenge is hard to handle sometimes. Sometimes He steps on our toes a little bit. So I'm reading from Luke chapter 12, verse number 13. Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. And Jesus replied, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? And then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Then I like this. Life is not measured by how much you own. 
boy is that anti-American. Life is not measured by what you own. What you possess doesn't give you life. Your job will not give you life. Your home will not give you life. Now, is there anything wrong with having nice things? No, but it's not the thing that's going to give you life. And so Jesus tells them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. And he said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. And so he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have enough room to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Now, before you walk away from here saying, Pastor says I need to cash in my 401K and all my retirement and give all that away, don't misunderstand me. Read that verse a little closer. He says, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth. There's no period there. The period is after, but he doesn't have a rich relationship with God. If you have a rich relationship with God, you may have ability to store things up. But that shouldn't be your primary focus. Your primary focus should be on having a rich relationship with God. There's a lot of people that are rich, but they don't have a rich relationship with God. Verse 22, then turning to his disciples, Jesus said, that's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Hmm. That hurts. Did you know that Jesus did not design you to worry about a 24-hour time period? As Pastor Trout used to say, you can say amen or oh me, it's still the truth. That's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear, for life is more than food and your body more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for God feeds them, and you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying about bigger things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work and make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what to eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. Listen, if you're worried about what kind of clothes you wear, what kind of house you live in, what kind of car you drive, what food you kind of eat, what you're doing is what all unbelievers do. You're worried about earthly things. But your Father already knows what you need. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. So don't be afraid, little flock. For it gives your Father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old. Men, you don't have to buy any more purses. Trish will say, grab my purse, and it's the purse, and the question is always, well, which one? These never wear out. They never go out of style. They're new every morning. They don't develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. My question to you today is, where is your heart? Where is your heart? If you really want a connection with God, 
we talked about being hungry last week and thirsty for him and seeking him. My question to you today is simply this. Where is your heart? Can I give you the biblical answer? Your heart is wherever your treasure is. Where's your treasure? I can tell you where your heart is based on where your treasure is. Now, I ask these men to sit up here because they represent you and me. Not quite as good looking as some of us, but they represent us. You see, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, Paul is talking and he says that he wants to pray over the whole being, the spirit, the soul, and the body. And so today I have uh, for you, David is our spirit. These three in the middle, Brian and Tra- uh, Travis and Owen, is our soul, and Jason is the body. You see, we sometimes think that the key ingredient to you and I connecting with God is something in here. But what the Bible says is your heart, where your heart is, that's where God's going to connect. God said it in Jeremiah 17. He says, based on your, according to your heart and according to your deeds, that's how God's going to respond to us. That's why we have to guard our heart. That's why we have to check our heart. Because the Bible says our heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. No man can know it. You don't know what's going on in there. So you have to test yourself. And the way you test your heart is you have to ask yourself, where is my heart right now? God revealed to me, where is my heart? Because my heart is going to affect my being. The heart is an interesting organ in the body. And uh, in the Bible, it's akin to two other things, kind of interchangeable terms. It's kind of gross. But the heart and the kidneys and the digestive system are all kind of connected together in Scripture. In other words, it's the innermost being of who we are. But there is a battle that goes on daily between the spirit, the soul, and the body. And you may say, well, why do I have three people up here recognizing the soul? I'll tell you why. The spirit is the thing that gives us life. The soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. And all three of them operate in our soul a little bit differently. The mind is our thought process. The mind is what we, in fact, the Bible says the mind is key to understanding and connecting with God. That's why it's closest to the life-giving spirit in this illustration. The mind is a thing. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Have your mind stayed on Christ. Bring every thought into captivity to Christ. The mind is key to connecting the rest of our body with the spirit. The problem is sitting in the same soul as our mind is our will and our and our um, well our heart our emotions, and the problem is emotions are close to our natural being, and so when we don't feel well, when somebody hasn't treated us well, when we've stubbed our toe, let me just ask you this: the last time you stubbed your toe, did you feel like worshiping? No, because your body sent a message to your uh, emotions saying, I'm angry right now, I'm hurt, and then our, the rest of our being leans toward that emotion and then leans toward a natural response to that which has messed with our emotions. Are you following along right now? And, and so we've got this thing right in the middle. Travis is our will, Our will is the thing that determines the direction in which we are going to go. That's why it's in the middle. Is is my will going to listen to my mind and spirit, or is my will going to listen to my emotions and my natural being? Are you following along? And all too often, we try to live and operate based off of our natural being. 
and we try to operate in our self-made mind of understanding. And so what ends up happening is all of a sudden something happens in the natural. It triggers emotions, whether it be good or bad emotions, either emotions are, are triggered, and those trigger into our will. But at the same time over here, the mind is saying one thing, and because the Spirit is feeding the mind, God deals with the thought process so that the thought process can dictate to the will. Because God doesn't want to play on your emotions. Why? Because your emotions are closer to your carnality than it is to your spirituality. He wants to get into your mind, into your thought process, and the way you think, and the way you respond, and the way you perceive things. And here's the problem. There's a heart in each one of them. Because the heart is simply the organ that pumps life from one part of the body to the next. In the natural, we have a heart in the inside of us. Just to the left, there's four chambers. There's two upper, two lower. And those four chambers both pump blood to the heart to, to, to cleanse it and to pump it back out and put all of the oxygen through our body. But that heart is also in Scripture attached to carnal flesh. When I say carnal, I'm not talking uh, evil or wicked. Carnality simply just means natural. Okay, pastor, what are you really talking about? If you try to live your life in the natural, you will struggle from here to eternity. Can you get to eternity? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you can't earn it, God's going to give it. And if you receive it, even if you receive it in the flesh, he's going to honor the gift. But you're going to struggle. You're going to fight. You're going to, 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 to uh, every day is going to be a battle that you're going to have to win. And the problem is, if you're dwelling in the natural, you're fighting in the natural. So you're trying to figure this out. You're trying to figure that out. And you're trying to do this because in your emotions, you're wanting to please God, but everything's bombarding you. And in your emotions are listening not to the spirit, which is way over here, but listening to the carnality, which is right close. And so all of a sudden... Let me ask an honest question. How many in here today are stubborn people? <laughs> There's some people raising some hands for others. <laughs> Did you know that stubbornness is a good quality? Now they're trying to put the hand down. Yeah. <laughs> Stubbornness is a great quality if you're being stubborn from the right place. But if you're being stubborn from the natural end of who you are, it will get you into trouble. You will bang your head against the wall. You will not see eye to eye with people. You will fight with reality because, man, it hurts to walk into walls. But if you are stubborn on the spirit end, Satan, whatever you bring to me, here I am. I'm not going anywhere. All of a sudden, that stubborn quality becomes a good quality. Depending on which part of the body you're listening to dictates to you whether or not your stubbornness is effective or ineffective. So where are you listening? So each part here has a heart. The natural has a heart both literally natural, the, the actual organ that's in here, but the flesh has a heart, a desire, okay? And that fleshly desire, listen. Well, I don't want to make anybody hungry. But, but <laughs> there's some things that from time to time I enjoy eating. In about six weeks, we're going to be in our annual vacation, and I will be sitting at the back porch eating Red Snapper for sure. Because I'm already craving it six weeks before. We crave things in the natural. That's our heart speaking to our natural. There is a heart in our emotions 
It's what we desire. We respond to situations based on our emotions. So when somebody uh, says something that's maybe hurtful, our desire in our emotions is to put a facade around or to give the international signal of I'm angry with you. If you don't know what that is, you can ask somebody next to you. And then there's a heart of the will. The heart of the will is trying to say there's a desire in our will that says, I want to do right. Paul emphasizes his will in Romans chapter 7. I don't know why I do wrong when I want to do right, and I don't know why I do right when I want to do wrong. What is he saying? He's saying, my will is in a fight. And then there's the mind, the brains of the function, The brains that dictate what goes around to the body and feeds the body data and information that dictates to us how we perceive things and think about things. And then there's the heart of the spirit that says, I want to overwhelm all of it and lead you and let you walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. But to walk after the spirit, you have to dictate what your heart is saying to you. And so what ends up happening, both your natural, your emotions, your will, your mind, and your spirit have got to come to a conclusion of what you're going to yearn after, what you're going to hunger after, what you're going to search for, what you're going to look for, what you're going to investigate, what you're going to grab a hold of. And that becomes hard When Jesus is everything and everywhere at all times. Because when was the last time you thought your car was spiritual? Definitely not when the power steering pump goes out. You see, which end of the spectrum are you operating on? Where is your heart? Or should the better question be is, which part of your heart is pumping the hardest right now? Is it your flesh and your emotions? Or is it your spirit and your mind? Because logically, if you step away from the emotion, logically you can look at the spirit and say, yeah, no matter what is going on on that end of my spectrum, God's in control. So the challenge today is how do you and I begin to operate our lives on that end of the spectrum? How do we get to where day in and day out we step forward from our mind being attached to the spirit instead of operating from the flesh and the emotions of the day? Because I'm sorry, you will never find happiness you will only be able to pursue it because happiness is a flesh aspect of life. Happiness is when your emotions are cool. Happiness is when the natural lines up to the way you want it to line up. But what you're really looking for is not happiness. You're looking for joy. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. And joy comes whether your emotions are right or whether your emotions are wrong, whether your emotions are high or they're low. It doesn't matter what's going on because you've got that stubborn thing in your heart that says it doesn't matter how bad it is. I know Jesus so I can sing a song of worship. I can sing a song of joy. I'm operating on this end of the spectrum. So how do we get there? How do we get from... See, it's so easy to live on that end. Can I tell you why it's so easy? Because the emotions are attached. And what do we get our emotions from? Sight, sound, taste, the five senses, the natural body. You stub your toe, the sense sends an emotional response. You get rejected, 
Your emotional response is based off of the senses that you are operating. See, down here is where our senses operate. They tend to operate between the, the body and the emotions. And so what ends up happening, because we can sense it, it's easy to grab a hold of it. But over in this dynamic, it doesn't operate by the senses. It operates by faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. You can't please God. I don't care if you become the greatest CEO that makes so many. I don't care if you create something that helps all of mankind. The Bible says without faith, you cannot please him. Somewhere along the line, we've got to get from the natural to the spiritual. Somewhere we've got to get from the emotions to the intellectual. Somewhere along the line, we've got to get our hearts operating on this end of the spectrum instead of that end of the spectrum. And the Bible gives us a clear directive on how to do it. We read it in the last scripture that I read today. In verse 34 of Luke chapter 12, the Bible says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In other words, if you want to get your heart over here, you better get your treasure over here. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Where your treasure is, that's where you're going to operate from. Where your treasure is, that's where you're going to get closer to God. Where your treasure is, is where your heart's going to connect with him. So what is treasure? Is it just money? No, money's part of it. I think there's at least three, probably more, but I thought of at least three things that go into man's treasure. Three things. Ready? Time, money, talent. Time, money, and talent. My question to you is, if you want to get your heart from that end to this end, you better identify where you're spending your time, your money, and your talent. I know that's not a great hoo-hoo kind of message, but somebody's got to grab a hold of this because it's my desire that this church would begin to operate by faith and not by sight, to walk after the things of the Spirit and not after the things of the flesh. We have got to create an opportunity to get from that end of the spectrum to this end of the spectrum so that we can ignore that which is actually going on and that we can not just ignore it, but we can cover it with the blood so that we can stand strong in the faith. So no matter what tidal wave hits us, no matter what political statement hits us, no matter what criticism or persecution comes our way, I will live by faith and not by sight. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. See, is there anything wrong with our possessions? Not if they're not dictating our being. You see, our possessions, and, and I've talked about this before, and, and quite frankly, I'm not shy about it. Because I'm tired of living on this end. I'm settling for less than what God has for me on that end. I'm settling with that which I can explain, that which I have a A, B, C, and D to, that which I can explain to you and tell you how we did it and where we came from. I'm wanting to get to the place where I can't explain what God does, but I can't deny what God does. I'm so hungry and thirsty to move my being from that which is carnal and fleshly to that which is spiritual and that which walks after faith and that which walks after the path of God. Because if I ever get to hear all of that's going going to fall into place. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. If they're meant for you to have them, you'll get them. You'll be able to use them. You'll be able to enjoy them. Don't get me wrong. I'm all for all of it. But what I am saying is there's got to be something in us where our heart goes where our treasure is. How much time are you spending in God things? If your only God time is 10.30 to 12 on a Sunday, your heart is not in the right spot. 
your heart is operating on that end and you're living below what God has promised. God promised it. We read it in Jeremiah. He will act upon what our actions are. He will move upon what our heart does. Why wouldn't you want God to move on your behalf? But you've got to get to the right side of your being. Listen, I want to say a few things about time. This will go together with next week when we show you all of the ministries that are getting ready to function fluidly and time that are spent. I've been in this thing my whole life. I've been a minister since 1988. I have spent hours and hours and hours. I have sacrificed vacations. I've sacrificed days off. I've sacrificed family time. I've sacrificed personal time. I'm not patting myself on the back, but I am here to say this. Because of the time that I have invested, I know beyond the shadow of a doubt when God begins to move and speak to me, he's not speaking to me down here. He's speaking to me over here. And my heart has been attuned to when God begins to move. If I would have spent all my time trying to figure out how to hit a golf club and, and a golf ball straight without a slice, and if I had spent all my time on that, I, I could be a good golfer, but I wouldn't be a good pastor. If I figured out how to be a fisherman, which to me doesn't make sense, unless I'm in a lake where every cast catches something, that's how patient I am with fishing. But I could become a master fisher, but I'd never become a fisher of men. I'd love to have a cabin or an RV or any of those things. But can I tell you, if I put all of my time into that, I wouldn't put as much time into you. What am I saying? Can I tell you where my heart is on Sundays? And Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays, I'll tell you where my heart is. It's in you. Why? Because you're so good? No. I'll tell you why. Because this is where my treasure is. You're my treasure. And the Bible promised me where my treasure is, that's where my heart's going to be. So when I pray for you, I'm not praying for you on a natural level. I've stepped into a level of faith. Hey, listen, some of you think you just decided to come to church today. Uh-uh, you've been prayed over. Not just by me, you've been prayed over. You're an answer to prayer to walk through those doors today. For this day, for this hour, you have been prayed over. Why? Because there have been people that have put their treasure on this end of the spectrum. And because that's where the treasure is, that's where their heart is. Can I tell you, on Wednesday at 1130, there's two or three people every Wednesday in this sanctuary praying over this church. Why? Because they don't have anything better to do? No, because they've placed their treasure in something. And because the treasure is there, their heart follows it. You want to get closer to God? Invest your time in godly things. Stop scrolling down Facebook and pick up the real book. Stop watching the TV and start watching the heavenlies. Start doing something that's different than you've ever done before. Instead of listening to sports radio or news talk in the car, kick on some spiritual worship music and then worship like you've never worshipped you before and just see what people will see and just see what heaven will see and just watch yourself go from this end of the spectrum to this end of the spectrum because the promise is where you spend your time or your treasure your heart is going to follow you know last week my youth pastor was here hadn't seen him in decades 
he said something to me. I would have never, I mean, I remembered it, but I would have never thought he would have remembered it. But before we were going to Bible school and to college, we were in a youth setting. And Greg decided to start saying something about each person that was getting ready to move from high school to to college. And he said something that rang in my spirit that I have tried to hold on to and I have tried to live up to since 1988. And uh, I'm a little stubborn that way on this end. And that is to be consistent. Part of it is my personality, I know. I I don't get rattled by too many things, but I don't get all that excited about too many things. I'm just kind of there. But he mentioned that in 1988, and after service last week, he mentioned it to me again. Thank you for being consistent. I hadn't talked to him in three decades. Why can I be consistent? Because my treasure's over here. I'll be honest with you, I could lose everything tomorrow, but I'll never lose him. Because that's where my treasure is. Lose cars, lose homes. Listen, a lot of you don't even realize when my wife and I came here to to become the pastor, it was the absolute worst time to pick up and move. Christmas of 2008, housing market, job market, God market. That's where my treasure was. I didn't mind living in my parents' basement. I didn't mind having a piece of junk car. I didn't mind any of that because my treasure Hey, listen, where are you spending your money? Where are you spending your money? Randy mentioned our acts giving today. For those of you that don't know, you can get online or you can write it on a piece of paper back there, but acts is our acting corporately to serve. It is our missions arm of this church. It is where we support uh, right now three main ministries. We support the church in MyCop. We We support the safe care. I was waiting to see if you came to yet, but not yet. The orphanage and and lost sheep ministries, we support them on a monthly basis. So when you give and you put in their acts, that goes out. That doesn't stay here. That goes to one of those ministries, and we've got percentages for each one of those ministries. We've got general giving. We've got this. I'm not talking about tithe. Tithe is not a gift. Tithe is a return on investment. Tithe is something totally different. But I believe that in our giving, where are you spending your money? Are you spending your money on a bunch of uh, different kinds of adventures? Are you going to here and going there and doing this and doing Doing that, but you haven't given to God? Listen, I don't want to manipulate or pressure anybody into giving. It's not about that. I don't know whether you give or not. I, I very rarely, if ever, ask Taryn who's giving, who's not giving. She'll come to me about some leaders maybe from time to time and just let me know they haven't given in a while, and, and it's usually because something has come up, but I don't know whether you give or you don't give. So you can't accuse me of coming into your living room today and, and, and trying to convict you and manipulate you. I am trying to give you an, a, a suggestion that if you want to get close to God, if you want your heart to get close to God find out where your treasure is where are you putting your money are you giving it to the things of God or are you giving it to the things of the world I'm not saying that they are wicked evil or anything else I'm talking about where is your priority are you spending more time on golf clubs and fishing and and, and all the kind of boating and whatever else is out there to do or are you spending enough money on the things of God you have heard me tell you before if you would check your calendar and your checkbook you will see the status of your heart where is your heart it's where your treasure is and where your treasure is is where you're going to find Jesus next week we're going to be introducing you to our shift haven't they look good I'm just leaving them up here because there's more commotion to put them back down We are instituting a shift in this church. 
We've always thought we're operating over here. And we were. But there's a deeper depth over here that God is challenging us to step into. And this church has done fairly well with the two aspects of our treasure. Listen, I'll just tell you, I told somebody recently, I don't know why I'm getting into all this. Give me just two, five, five more minutes. Not two, five more minutes, just five more minutes. Maybe two, five more minutes. But I've heard somebody say, oh, I'm so thankful that I'm part of a giving church. Can I tell you that we are a giving church? But we are giving so much below our potential. How do I know? Because I'm living so far below my potential. Can you just, I just want you to, okay, Mr. Math, get ready here for me. If I take the four of us to McDonald's for one meal a week, just one, I'm spending a minimum of $35 for the four of us. And that's McDonald's. That's not good food. $35. If I took one meal a week at $35, how much would I give in a year? 35 by 52. Yeah. 35 times 75, or 52. 40? You could give, how many have given $4,200 a year? It's not hard. It's one McDonald's meal for four people per week. Where's your treasure? This isn't meant to be a fundraising service, but I've got to tell you, that your heart sometimes gets pricked when God is trying to speak to you and our desire is to get closer to him, but we don't want to talk about what's going to get us closer to him. Going to the ball game instead of coming to church. Is there anything wrong with the ball game? No. I've been. I'll go again. You got tickets. Give me a call. But I won't miss church for it. Listen, I know I live in a family of of ministry, but even if my family wasn't in ministry, we have monthly dinners on Sunday afternoons. The earliest we will ever meet them is 3 o'clock because I ain't messing with Sunday service, and I'm not messing with after service being able to minister and talk to some of you. Where's your treasure? I don't mean to sound like I'm patting myself. I've got room to grow. I did tell you that it was me going through McDonald's. Think about that. $4,200 a year towards your treasure house or one McDonald's per week. Where's our treasure? Where's our treasure? How bad off were you? Don't even want to tell you. (laughs) <laughs> now the big one that'll apply next week. Where are you putting your talents? Now I'm going to say something and you need to hear this. Talents and ministries are not just in the house. If God has called you to be a secretary, you be the best secretary, the most anointed secretary you can, and your treasure house will be filled. It doesn't matter whether it's in the house or out of the house. When you do what God has opened up the door for you to do, you do it with all your might and put your treasure there and just see where your heart goes. But we're going to be creating a lot of opportunities of service in this house. And our goal is to have 80% of you beginning to do something for the kingdom of God as part of this house as well as your life. But as part of this house, 80% of us doing some things for the kingdom of God. Why? Because it's our treasure. My talent, the ability that God has given me is a treasure that he has given me and where I put my treasure, my heart's going to follow. Jesus, I want you. 
Jesus, I need you. I have preached message after message after message throughout my entire ministry about God coming near. I don't know that I've ever preached it this way, but if you want God to come near, you need to draw near to God. And the way the Bible tells us is where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to follow. I think it's 1 Peter chapter 5. I invite you to stand. It was only one five minute. I, I, I believe it's 1 Peter chapter 5. In the same way, you younger men must accept the authority of the elders. And all of you serve each other in humility. For God opposes the proud but favors the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. There's another passage that says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Listen, God doesn't need our praise. He doesn't get a big head because we praise him. He doesn't need our worship. Praise and worship is not about him. Praise and worship is about us. I've got to praise him. I've got to worship him because as I praise him and worship him, I'm releasing some of myself at his feet and he's able to step in. I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, but God doesn't need you and he doesn't need me, but he wants us. He desires us to contact him, to connect with him. So I close with the question that I opened. Where is your heart today? And if you don't know where your heart is, check out your treasure box. Because in that treasure box is where you're going to find your heart. And I pray that you find your heart on this end of the spectrum. Because over here is closer to him. Would you just raise your spirits and your arms and your mouths in this hour right here as we come to an end of this service? And in your heart and your mind right now, evaluate what's in your treasure box. Where have you fallen short? Where haven't you given? Where have you placed your treasure? In a very quick manner, we're just about done. But if you have done an evaluation and you have a desire in your heart to say, Lord, I want to put my treasure in you, my time, my resource, my talent, would you step out of your seat and into an aisleway or make your way up front just for a moment? just for a couple of minutes. Do you want to draw closer to him? Do you want your heart to be after him? Where's your treasure today? God 
I'm going to put my treasure towards you. My heart may not be in it yet, God, but I'm going to start with my treasure. My heart will catch up. Praise God. Praise God. All across the house today. Would you once again reach out to him in your own personal way? God, I love you. My heart needs to connect with you, so I need to adjust my treasure. Jesus, in your name. Jesus, in your name. God, here's my time. Here's my talents. Here's my resources. Lord, as you speak, I'll follow. As you call, I'll answer. Jesus, across this congregation right now, I pray for each person that has made a step towards you. Lord, that has made a conscientious decision to say, I want my treasure in the right place so that my heart will follow. I want to be close to you, Jesus. And so once again, God, I'm going to recommit my time and my talent and my resource to the things that you have deemed righteous. I'm going to readjust my priorities. I'm thankful for the blessings of the things that you've given me in this world that allow my natural man to enjoy life. But God, my priorities are going to switch. I want to live by faith, God. I want to live by your word, God. And you said I don't need to worry about these other things. But if I worry about the kingdom, that you'll meet every need. Now, Jesus, as their pastor, Lord, I come before you for them. I'm asking you to unleash heaven. I'm asking you to open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And every time they put something into the treasury, Lord God, flood their soul with a heavenly anointing and a glorious power and authority that they have not yet experienced and let them step into a new dimension of faith. Every time, Lord, they spend time with you, every time, Lord, they give to you, every time, Lord, they serve, I'm asking you, Jesus, to release all of heaven at their disposal, God. Let them sense you. Let them feel you. Let them experience you. Let them contact you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Mm. I want to challenge you this week to really do what only you can do. And intentionally sit down and ask God, is my treasury out of order? And if it is, God, help me get it back into order. See, there's nothing wrong with golf clubs and boats and fishing and vacation and cabins. There's nothing wrong with that until it displaces the scales in your treasury. If the scales of your treasury are all leaning towards him, enjoy the boat. Enjoy the golf clubs. Enjoy the scenery. Enjoy the cabin. Enjoy vacations. Enjoy all of those things. 
But always know your heart goes where you spend. For where the treasure is, that's where your heart is also. I want to be so close to him. I want to be so close to him that when we walk in the doors of this sanctuary, the glory is so... Before we even teach, before the Sunday school kids even begin to sing their songs, that the Holy Ghost sweeps through our kids and they just have an all-out altar service before they've even broken the books. Watching our young people walk out of their room at the start of the 1030 service, totally lost and wiped out by the presence of God. Listen, I know it can happen because I've seen it happen. I've seen young people walk from a prayer room into a service totally gone in the spirit and walk into a service and it ignites something in the service where all across the congregation it explodes. Why? Because those young people put some place of treasure where their heart got close to God. They invested their time and their resource and their energy. You take one step, he'll take two. One step, two steps. I want to invite you to make sure to visit Kim, but then also visit Wayne and Claire. Their booth is over there on the left. Thank you for your offering to them today. We'll be getting that to them. Thank you for your monthly support of them. I just believe that as this church unleashes its treasure, there's nothing stopping us because we'll be so close to him, so close to him. Part of the reason why this building is so beautiful is because this church gave monthly above and beyond anything that they had to offer. And God took us and blessed us all along the way. And 200 and some thousand dollars later, this is what we get. Because there were people. Resource and talent. Find out where you can give this week. Ask God. And then come back next week on fire and ready to worship and ready to receive what God is doing in this house. We love you all so very much. Greet one another. Go in the grace and the mercy of God. Again, make sure to stop and talk to Wayne and Claire. And...